Um, hi everybody or anybody. Um, I am having a Peroni and uh, I did not cut lumps off the back of my hair. I was just joking with you. Um, but I did give myself a bit of a trim. But anyway, we're here to discuss on Earth, We're Briefly Gorgeous um, by Ocean Vuong, which uh, I just was flicking through it again today and going through different passages that I had like marked and constantly just floored by the poetry of his writing. And I wanted to start off with saying how I came to the book in the first place. And I think, and because I'd saved this in my notes on my phone, um, but it was an article I had read and it was either in the New Yorker or on NPR. So I'm sorry, I don't remember which one, but it started off and it was saying, he also wanted to say something about where the cost of war falls, not from the vantage point of the grand historical epic, but from inside the small cramped sadness of a house still flattened decades after the conflict had ended. And then the quote is from Ocean. It's the stories of our species that men create these wars and women clean them up. They clean them up emotionally. They have to deal with the PTSD that comes home. They have to postpone their own healing, forego their own self-care in order to hold these households together. They literally nurse these broken bodies back to health. I wanted a book to bear that to honor that without romanticizing it. To say women have been doing this and they're not necessarily these hero heroic legends. What's the mental cost for these women who do these extraordinary things? In the book, the cost is their own private life. So I read that <laughs> and I was like, I need to uh, read this book and I was, completely not disappointed. So let's, um, let's hear what you guys thought. What can I, can I see some, what do you think was Little Dog's reason for writing this letter? Well, I think it start. I mean, the opening of the book sort of tells us that he, he says, dear Ma, I am writing this to reach you. And I think from that moment, you just know that every word that he puts down on this page is wrought with the desire to connect and the pain that it is to communicate when, when people are really damaged. And I think that that's you know, what struck me so much about this book is how, how damage gets passed down from one generation to the next and how when people are hurt, or they're wounded, they end up wounding. And I mean, there's so much pain in this book, but there's also so much beauty, which, yeah, that's kind of why I love it so much. Let's see. Um, I'm a mom of a transgender boy. Oh, how do I take this back? How I wish he could actually write to me with his feelings. You know, maybe if you write to him first, um, that's Asu Gemini. Um, I think it's an amazing thing to encourage him to do. I think it's sometimes a safer space for us to write our feelings down than to actually have to sit and speak them. Um, sometimes it's too vulnerable. So maybe it's a good idea for you to write your feelings to him and maybe he'll reciprocate. Um, okay, so I'm a book junkie. I've never been into poetry, but it read like that, right? I find it difficult to read in long spans, but find it beautiful. I'm glad you did, but I agree. I think his writing is so poetic. Um, just the syntax and the and the, the way that he evokes these images with, with simple, I mean, I have, <laughs> I have marked so many moments in this book because it just, oh, I mean, this was one line that, that killed me. It's like, I am writing you from inside a body that used to be in yours. I mean, it's a very simple way of saying something, but not any way that I've heard somebody speak like that before. Um, what part of the book spoke to me emotionally the most? Um, I mean, there was so many. I think his, when he directly speaks or invokes his mother, I think that was really 
really just heartbreaking. But I also think when he speaks about her inability to sometimes express herself and so when she would hit him or lash out at him and that absolute trauma within her that she was never given the tools how to express herself and so it just comes out in these like aggressive and, and erratic and sometimes really awful moments and, and I think those were really awful but um the, the you know when Lan died that I was sobbing um let's see okay what do you think about the next reading being a book recommended by us well we could but it's my book club so <laughs> Uh, someone saying they listen to the audiobook and it's read by the author. I would actually 100% listen to that. I might actually go do that. Thank you for the recommendation. I love the part about absorbing memories that starts with the monkeys but really speaks to the little dog trying to soak up every memory of his family and having to live with the trauma passed down. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I kind of just want to read different passages if, if that's okay. Um, Oh, this bit. I, I, I love this bit. When, when it comes to words, you possess fewer than the coins saved from your nail salon's tips in the milk gallon under the kitchen cabinet. Often you gesture to a bird, a flower or a pair of lace curtains from Walmart and say only that it's beautiful. Whatever it was, deep, deep quoi, you once exclaimed, pointing to the hummingbird whirring above the creamy orchid in the neighbor's yard. It's beautiful. You asked me what it was called and I answered in English, the only language I had for it. You nodded blankly. I mean, just the fact that here is someone who has found solace in words and it's the polar opposite to what his mother has, that she has such a limited education and such a limited vocabulary, even in Vietnamese. Um, it's just, I don't know, it really, really touched me. Um, and I also want to say, you know, part of what I try and do with this book club or part of what I love about reading so much is that we get to walk in the shoes of an experience or a life that is so different to our own. And, you know, I have never really read something from that perspective, from a Vietnamese immigrant perspective from an American, but also a young man coming to terms with his sexuality in this way. Um, so I, I hope you all enjoyed embodying and walking in the steps of someone's experience that was very different to your own. And, and I think it's that's what literature gives us and reading gives us is this amazing capacity for empathy because we understand another life in a way that we could never just from our own everyday life. Um, I'm going to read one more bit and then I'm going to come back to questions. What is it? I should have like actually marked instead of just postmarking. Oh, I know what this bit is. Um, it was just more about when she goes to try and rescue her sister in the middle of the night because she believes that he's her husband's going to kill her and then they get to a place and Lan tells her, but Mai has not lived here for five years. Lan says with sudden tenderness, Rose, although I don't see it, I can tell she's brushing her hair behind your ear. Mai moved to Florida, remember, to open her own salon. Lan is poised, her shoulders relaxed. Someone else has stepped inside her and started moving her limbs, her lips. We go home, you need sleep, Rose. And the tenderness of motherhood absolutely surpasses any of the problems with her schizophrenia anything like that it's just she's able to just be there for her poor daughter who's obviously in a lot of distress and trauma so um let's go to some more questions um why do i think he begins a letter with let me begin again because i think he says it um later in the book where he says that this is the second time he's tried to write this book and I love that he allows 
himself to sort of speak in, in almost a stream of consciousness. There's not a, uh, he doesn't feel sort of pressure or obliged to, you know, set a scene and, and open up a book in a very kind of like, it was a such and such a day or whatever, you know, it's just this beautiful ability to start from a ver from the thought from that you know and it's and that's i think what makes it so intimate is that it isn't it's not performative in many ways it's very very personal um so i love that uh okay hi france somebody said can you see the value in writing a letter to someone who can't read of course, I think, I think what you learn from this and what I got from this book was the amount of compassion that little dog has for his mother. And that even though they have a fraught relationship and that even though there is this gulf between them, he has escaped enough or evolved enough that he's he's aware that she might not even be able to have the emotional language to understand all of this and in some ways it's as much for him that he writes this and that he sorts out all his own complicated feelings and he puts it on paper because he knows that she loves him um which is kind of the most important thing and he'll probably never get to have this kind of conversation the way that he wants to have but at least he can express himself in this way I think that's at least that's my my interpretation um what resonated with me most the prose or the story or the characters um I would say it's um I think it's always a combination of all of those things. I think the best kind of writing um, brings you in in a multitude of ways. It's never just about one thing. I think you can have beautiful writing and shitty plot and it doesn't make for an, a compelling book or you can have great plot and shitty writing. Um, I just was really moved by it just was such a unique voice and, and again that personal it almost felt voyeuristic to be reading some of this and um and again just yeah the poetry of it i mean the ability to to con conjure an image i mean there's one uh when they went to the butchers and she just kind of go oh the ribs are like are just like a person's after they're burnt and you're like ah and she laughs and and that gives you so much more information in one sentence about the things that she has seen and experienced and the places she has been um, than if he had just started off the story like, oh, my mother, she was born here and here and here, you know, um, I think, anyway, that's what I think. Um, oh. So we're getting into, I thought I had marked more earlier on. Um, let's go to some more questions. Did the theme of Dyspora resonate with you? Yes, um, I think, you know, I left Ireland at the age of 18. Um, Obviously, my experience has been very different, but I do recognize something of living in a place that's not your own and this idea of constantly sort of not being one thing or the other, as in I am, of obviously I'm Irish, but because I've not lived there, I've lived, I've, I've not lived there longer than I lived there at this point. I don't have the same experience as an Irish person living in Ireland. I've missed a whole cultural experience that makes people who live in Ireland now Irish. And so you feel a little bit like a stranger when you go home, as much as when Lan went to Vietnam and, or not Lan, when Little Dog went to Vietnam after Lan's 
funeral, um, you know, it's this thing of being between worlds and you're not, you're never, you know, when I was living in America, I was never an American. I'm living in Scotland, I'm not Scottish. But I don't really have all of those things that people in Ireland have as in references and all of these things. So yeah, I, I definitely connected with that. Um, let's see. I, Kelly, Kelly, I'm so sorry. Kelly L. Austin. Um, love, love, love this. Wanted to use this wanted to use selections to show my students that extraordinarily beautiful writing can be about really dark and frightening things. I totally agree. I think this book should definitely be taught um, at every English class. Well, maybe not English class. There's probably a few, a few passages that wouldn't be, you know, suitable, but mm. um, Red Stripes 21. <laughs> I especially liked reading the struggles of the language barriers that I encountered for somebody living in a country where I don't fully speak the native language. I hear you, been there. Um, I loved feeling little dogs grow through his words completely. Oh yeah, we were exchanging truths, I realized, which is to say we were cutting one another. Yes, that scene in Dunkin' Donuts that was a real heartbreaker. Um, I'm going to read another. I'm going to read about sort of just after Trevor has been introduced, but it's a little bit later and he says, but how do I tell you about the boy without telling you about the drugs that blew it apart, the oxy and the coke, the way they made the world smolder at its tips. And then the red, red rust red Chevy the one Buford gave his son, Trev's old man, when he was just 24. The one the old man cherished, having repaired and replaced enough parts to make four trucks over, the, over through the years. How its windows were already blue streaked and its tires smooth as human skin by the time we blasted through the corn. Going 55 as Trevor shouted crazy, a patch of fentanyl hopped on his arm. The liquid melted through its edges and dripping down his bicep like sick sap. Cocaine in our noses, our lungs, we laughed in a way. And then the swerve, a smithereen of yellow, the slam, glass skittering, the crushed hood smoldering under the dead oak. A red line running down Trevor's cheek, then widening at his jaw. Then his daddy calling from the house, the rage in his scream jolting us from the, from the seats. Again, it's like his ability to be within a scene and, and describe it in almost these disjointed flashes, but yet it all, I don't know, it just all is so descriptive and makes you really feel like you can see every single moment. Um, and and I, I actually, you know, I think this is also one of the things I love about this book is that it, it sort of touches on so many aspects of issues that are very current and problematic in America today without it feeling like he purposefully or preach, wanted to preach or anything like that. But this whole section that he had and I'm going to find it on Oxycontin. Um, and just in, in so few lines, how he managed to touch on an epidemic um, that is ravaging parts of America with, with such brevity, but yet such sharpness I, I, that's the thing about his writing it's like his scalpel it's like so sharp um trevor was put on oxycontin after breaking his ankle during dirt bike jumps in the woods a year before i met him he was 15. oxycontin first mass produced by purdue pharma in 1996 is an opioid essentially making it heroin in pill form after a month 
on Oxy. Trevor's ankle healed, but he was a full blown addict. And I'm going to go to 182 where they Using a multi-million dollar ad campaign, Purdue sold OxyContin to doctors as safe, abuse resistant, means of managing pain. The company went on to claim that less than 1% of users became addicted, which was a lie. By 2002, prescriptions of OxyContin for non-cancer pain increased nearly 10 times, with total sales reaching over 3 billion. And so in a very personal, an emotional story about drug addiction. He's able to just lay in these little, mo you know, bits of information that floor you because, I mean, that's, those statistics are just insane. Um, okay, sorry, I'll keep going. Um, these are going so fast, I don't know how to, um, do, 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 do. I've read about I've read about kids coming through Rwandan war and the traumas are similar. It made me think of the kids living through war now and how it will affect society in another 10 to 20 years. I mean, this is the thing. Um, trauma, I mean, you think of the, the children in Syria and, and if anyone has um, not seen For Sama, the documentary, I highly, highly recommend it. It's not going to be the most fun um, documentary to watch, but we have to consider these things, you know, in our lives. It's, do we have a responsibility as a human race to look after everyone? And do we have to think about what our own personal countries, our own personal governments, their policies, how do they affect people around the world? And are those things that matter to us? And maybe they don't. And maybe, you know, people think I need to just take care of my own little community and that's okay. But, you know, there is a butterfly effect to every single action and, you know, none of us live on an island. Um, not good to get preachy. Um, The saddest thing was the wasted potential of little of little dogs, friends, neighbors, and family. I know. I mean, this is. I think it's it's a it's a terrible um, epidemic that has ravaged America. As children, we often forget that our parents had a life that is separate from our own. It made me think about my own mother more deeply and the life she's lived. Well, that's amazing. Um, let me see. Sometimes writing a letter isn't just for who you're writing it for. Yes, this is too. Um, I also think he starts it the way he does because he lives in two worlds, America and home with Hong and Lan. And in his story, he's learning to make space for those identities. Very true. Um, this book is so beautifully written, it shined a light on Vietnamese and American cultures from such a knowing viewpoint. Also reading the book, Saigon, which is similarly provoking and beautiful. I don't know of that one yet, but I will look it up. Um, I have read his poem, Trevor. Um, boom, boom, boom. Let's see what else. I love the way he spoke about certain memories, like when he said, it could have been this or that, or this or this and so forth. Yes, I agree. Um, so excited to read the next book from your book club. Yes, well, I'm excited to let you all know about it, which I will in about three or four minutes. Ah, this inspired me to write a letter to my parents after not being with them for nine years. I was 15 and I was 24 when I visited them again. I'm just unsure how to let out how I feel. I think you just start with being honest and, you know, sometimes it's 
take your time, you know. I think as long as you remember that they always love you, no matter how they may be in a, unable to express that. Um, we all were given very different tools from our parents and they were given different tools from their parents, but, you know, love is always there. Um, doo -doo. The part where he goes shopping with his family and he's needed to translate is both, it's too terrifying, it broke my heart. He could just stand there while they, while the grocers laughed at his mother's, I know. Um, okay, what else have we got? Did your grandma also ask you to take out the snow in her hair? I feel like this is a very Asian thing to do. Um, no, both my grandparents, I think, had quite a bit of snow in their hair by the time um, I remember them. But uh, my Aunt Mary, who had the most amazing jet black, long poker straight hair, um, I remember as kids, we would brush it for ages. Um, and as we got a bit older, I remember once or twice she told us to pull out her, her little white hairs, but it's a lovely memory actually. Um, have I read Americana? Yes, by, and I'm going to butcher her name and I'm very sorry, Chimamanda Adichie. Um, it's a great book. So why did I start book club? Um, because I love to read and you guys love to read. And I feel like there was always tweets going back and forth about what I was reading or what you guys were reading. And it just felt like, well, why not create a little community? Um, obviously I love Outlander so much, but sometimes the conversation is always that. And I thought it would be nice to have a conversation where we just discuss other literature and um, pick other books and it's not to detract from that because I still have my very much Outlander focused other Instagram but this is just something that's kind of um, connected but a little bit separate so I thought it'd be fun. Um, as a fellow traveller that had lived in different countries especially at a young age what advice do you have when trying to keep your identity while forced to assimilate especially in, in the USA? Um, I don't know because I don't, I don't know, um, I, I don't understand how you're being forced to assimilate. Um, I think that it's a very hard thing to adapt to a place, um, and not feel like a stranger and feel isolated but also retain your own identity. Um, it's probably a little easier for me because I'm Irish and literally everywhere you go, there is an Irish bar. Um, I remember uh, years ago when I, I was backpacking and I went to Nepal and one of the first things you, you saw coming out of the Kathmandu airport, at least back then, was a massive Guinness sign and a sign, a little sign saying an Irish bar this way. Um, so actually when I when I first left Ireland and I was 18 I moved to France and I had a lot of friends and I went to an Irish bar and met a guy and met lots of Irish people and so I found myself too much surrounded by Irish people so when I moved to America it was almost like a conscious decision not to go down that same path because I wanted to I suppose not just um, shelter in what I know um, and in the end you know I ended up of course having a big ton of Irish friends but I think it was good for a while to sort of try and just explore without going down that sort of safe path but um, I hope you figure it out or it gets easier. Um, Okay, I'm gonna read one or two more things and then and then I will tell you what our new book is. Um, right. 
right. Oh, this is beautiful. This is when he is writing about um, Lan passing away. But um, he says, we try to preserve life even when we know it has no chance of enduring its body, we feed it, keep it comfortable, bathe it, medicate it, caress it, even sing to it. We tend to these basic functions, not because we are brave or selfless, but because like breath, it is the most fundamental act of our species to sustain the body until time leaves it behind. I think that was quite beautiful. And this will be the last passage I read. Um, I am thinking of beauty again, how some things are haunted because we have deemed them beautiful. If relative to the history of our planet, an individual life is so short, a blink of an eye, as they say, then to be gorgeous, even from the day you're born to the day you die, is to be gorgeous only briefly. Like right now, how the sun is coming on, low behind the elms, and I can tell the difference between a sunset and a sunrise. And I can't tell the difference between a sunset and a sunrise. The world, reddening, appears the same to me. And I lose track of east and west. The colours this morning have the frayed tint of something already leaving. I think of the time Trev and I sat on the tool shed roof, watching the sun sink. I wasn't so much surprised by its effect how in a few minutes, in a few crushed minutes, it changes the way things are seen, including ourselves, but that it was ever mine to see, because the sunset, like survival, exists only on the verge of its own disappearing. To be gorgeous, you must first be seen, but to be seen allows you to be hunted. So beautiful. Um, I hope you all enjoyed it. I know that it was a difficult read for some of you. And I think if you have experienced trauma, sometimes this can be triggering, but I also think that sometimes it can be healing because we can understand that other people have experienced something like maybe what you have, or there's some kind of connection. And hopefully that also means that you will find a way through it, just like Ocean has, and be it through writing, or be it through art, or creating, or loving, or peace, or gardening, or whatever it is for you that sometimes, you know, we, we know we have to let go of it or we have to move through it, that it'll never fully leave us, but, um, but yeah, it's possible. So I should have had it right here, but I went to get my beer and I forgot to grab the book. So one second. Ooh. All right. I've totally left it downstairs there. Okay. Well, and the book is called Ordinary People, Not to be Confused with Normal People, um, which you all know that I've read and have loved and I have been raving about it. And if you haven't seen the TV show, you should also watch it. This is a book by Diana Evans. Um, there was a movie out years ago also called Ordinary People. It is not the same. Um, I have looked up, I know it is definitely in French. I believe it is in Spanish. Um, I, it is really hard to find out how many languages books are translated in, or maybe I'm just looking in the wrong place. Um, if you work in publishing, please tell me how I can find out better. Um, but yes, so Ordinary People, Diana Evans. I will post a picture because I have forgotten to bring the book up here. Um, and I, yeah. I just want to really thank you all for joining. Um, it's been lovely chatting to you, chatting to myself, presuming that you're listening. Um, how very presumptuous of me. And I haven't hardly touched my beer. Mm. But um, yeah, I hope, I hope that you 
enjoy reading and we will connect again in a couple of weeks. Bye. Pour yourself a pina colada and get...